Hi everyone, um, I'm Chris Keel. I, uh, I probably won't have time for questions today, so if you have any questions, please reach out to me on the internet. This is generally how I appear on the internet, or come say hi to me after the conference. So today I'm gonna to be talking about match specifications, which have come up in a few Elixir confs in the past. People who present on ETS or tracing uh, have mentioned this before. So I'm curious, who here today has used match specs before? That's a decent number of hands. It's a little more than I thought. Uh, they're not the most accessible feature of the Beam Virtual Machine, but they are pretty cool. Uh, they let you do fast functional filtering. That's the title of the talk. I should know that offhand. And, and what this means is in any Beam Virtual Machine language, Erlang, Elixir, Gleam, I can't think of why they wouldn't work on Gleam, you can do some pretty cool fast pattern matching, more than what you're normally used to. Um, if I have time, I'm going to try to introduce Matcha, which is a little library I've been working on to help use match specifications, but we'll see how that goes. So a really quick background of some of the key concepts, Erlang, ETS, and pattern matching. Um, everyone here is probably familiar with Erlang. In the beginning, there was C++. That was widely regarded as a bad move. And then some smart people said, let's make a more resilient programming language than C++. And uh, they said, let there be Erlang. And it was good. <laughs> so they wanted a resilient programming language. And in order for, for your program to be resilient, it has to be able to run on more than one machine in case one blows up. Now, because your code is running on more than one machine, you also have to somehow model the fact that your program might be running multiple things at once. And that's what lightweight processes are for. And then, you know, once you have a bunch of processes talking to each other, if they could all mutate the same memory under the hood, things would be crazy. It would be impossible to reason about your program. And so Erlang is a functional programming language. It's functional and concurrent, not by design, but as a property of being resilient. So this causes some problems, though. Uh, problems that ETS tries to solve. ETS uh, solves the problem of when you have a lot of data in a concurrent functional environment, let's say gigabytes and gigabytes of data, what are you going to do with all of that state? Well, you're probably going to throw it into a process, but if that process crashes, then you've lost all of your state. And, and also, if other people want to access tidbits of that data inside of that process, they're going to be overwhelming that process all of the time. So to keep it from crashing, you throw it into a gen server. But a gen server serializes access. So if a lot of people are trying to get at your giant blob of state, it's going to be pretty slow in Erlang. It doesn't scale well when there's like read-write contention. And what's frustrating is this is very easy to implement in C++, right? In C++, you just grab a giant gob of memory, give everyone global access to it, and let everyone go crazy, and then really hope that your program is correct. So when people invented Erlang, they said, let's create a way to store arbitrary Erlang terms uh, in a giant blob of memory that C++ will manage, and anyone can access at any time, but let's add some guardrails. And those of you who have used ETS today um, know that you can pretty much throw anything in there, anything in Erlang in there, pull it out from any other process you want, and it's nice, and it's fast, and it's a little more efficient than message passing, because the whole thing is implemented in C++. Okay, and then last background thing, what is a pattern match? Everyone here knows what a pattern match is, I assume. If you've destructured an assignment, that's a pattern match. If you've written an anonymous function with multiple clauses, that's also a pattern match. My favorite example is defining named functions and pattern matching inside of them. And when I realized you could do this nine years ago, this is when I fell in love with Elixir because 
you don't have to have any syntax for variadic functions or overriding functions. You just pattern match inside of the function heads, and it's gorgeous. But today, we're mostly going to be focusing on case statements. I, I like case statements for this example because they're the simplest syntax to do a pattern match, right? The, the syntax is really straightforward. In this case, we're saying, I have a point. If it's 0, that's cool. If that point of x is greater than y, that's cool. And anything else, let's reject that. And that sort of describes this graph in the corner. There we go. So pattern matches have four key components. You have the thing you're trying to pattern match against. It can be any airline term. You have multiple clauses. And when you try to pattern match, if it fails, it falls through to the next one. The pattern itself is a single thing. Uh, this is where we do our structural and literal matching, right? Uh, you try and fit something inside of a tuple. You try and see if it matches with the zero, zero that we gave in our origin. And there's some special semantics in match patterns. Uh, there are some things you can do, some things you can't do. If you've ever seen match error not allowed, that's where that's coming from. Guards are kind of similar. You can have multiple ones of them. Uh, only a certain number of things are allowed in guards, which you've probably encountered. And I'll explain why a little later in this talk. And then this is where we do our typing and logical matching. So is this an integer? Is this greater than 0? Uh, things like that. And then if your clause passes, you're home free. You can execute any code you want and provide a return value for your pattern match. So why am I talking about match specifications today? Well, I'm not going to be for most of this talk. Um, we're going to talk about a different feature that I really like and organically discover why match specifications are what they are how they work under the hood, and, and why they're so frustrating to work with sometimes. So I'm going to be talking mostly about first-class pattern matches today. Don't Google that term. It doesn't exist. I made it up for this conference. Um, but we can sort of reason about what this might look like, right? First-class functions we're all pretty familiar with. It's uh, You have code that you don't want to execute yet, so you throw it in a function. And because we have first-class functions, we can do this at runtime. We can define an anonymous function and throw that into a variable and pass it around. We can get a reference to an existing compiled function, throw that in a variable, pass it around to another process, call it when we want to call it, even pass it to other functions, and let those functions call it when it wants to call it. First-class functions. So first-class pattern matches look very much the same. And instead of case, we have this match keyword. And you notice we're not matching against anything. We're just describing, we're specifying, if you will, the match that we want to do later. And we throw that into a variable. And we can match when we want to match and pass to other functions when we want those functions to do it. And the really cool thing about first-class pattern matches is that they don't exist. This isn't an actual syntactical <laughs> thing. But I am stubborn, and I needed more content for this presentation. So we're going to build our own. So how are we going to build our own? Well, some of you might just say, hey, pattern matches aren't first class, but just throw that first class, that non-first class pattern match into a first class function. And you can pass that function around, invoke your pattern match when you want to. And you are absolutely right. And this works, and this is probably the right way to do a lot of things. <laughs> but I'm stubborn, so let's get into why I don't want to do it this way. Well, most importantly, there is an overhead when you invoke a function, right? Uh, you have to do a couple of things. The virtual machine in C++ land has to do a couple of things. It has to uh, set up a new call frame on the call stack, manipulate registers, manage any variables that an anonymous function closed over, error handling. I'm just making stuff up at this point. I don't know. I didn't write the Beam virtual machine. But this is how programming languages work. And a lot of very smart people optimize this part of the Beam virtual machine. Um, but at the end of the day, you do have to pay the tax, no matter how fast we make it, for calling a function. And only then do we get to invoke the pattern matching engine in C++ that does the pattern matching things. This is true even if we you know, uh, wrote this as a single function where we pattern match it in the function head. Instead of nesting the case, it still has to go through that function call. But all we really want is to pattern match, right? Just whenever we want to pattern match, we just want it to be lazy like functions are. And the reason why this is important is because if you're doing a lot of pattern matching in a tight inner loop, like a num or something, right, you have to pay that tax to invoke the function every single time you attempt a pattern match. 
there's a lot of data, say gigabytes of data, that that's a no-go. So let's take some notes. For our own implementation of first-class pattern matches, we're definitely going to need to avoid the call overhead of a function. Now, in order to implement this, we, we need some data structure, right? Pattern matches aren't first-class citizens. They're not a type like functions, uh, like integers. So we have to represent them with some data structure. Now, it's pretty easy to imagine what this data structure must look like initially, right? Uh, a pattern match is a list of clauses that you attempt. So it's ordered. A list is a great fit for this. And each clause is a, a pattern and some guards and a body. So a three-tuple. But then we kind of get stuck, right? Uh, this is a data structure meant to describe something via data, but what we really want to do here is write our code. And we I can't, right? This is a data structure. We can't just throw some code in there and expect it to make sense. So we need to somehow encode our code inside of this data structure, and the function that we will pass it to to do the pattern matching, to invoke the raw pattern matching engine underneath, will say, hey, I know how this works. This looks like data, but it's code. I'll execute it for you. So that's our second requirement. We want to represent code as data. And then finally, I mentioned there are some special semantics. Um, in patterns, right, there are only some things we can do and some things we can't do. We can destructure terms, right? Um, we can say, hey, this is one thing, but I know it's a tuple, so let's destructure that tuple into x and y. Uh, there are other things we can do. We can bind those x and y variables. We can match everything as well. A couple of other features, ignorable terms, a pin operator, special semantics and match patterns. Similarly, in guards, uh, you can only use a special subset of functions. And this is actually an interesting question. Why can you only use a special subset of functions in guards? Um, I, I helped implement def guard, and this was a question that intrigued me very much, so I dug into it. That's how I found out about match specs. But, but think about when a guard executes. Uh, it has access to the variables from the pattern match, so it has some in-memory data. And it needs to check out that in-memory data, right? But it's doing this, like every time you call a function, that's a potential pattern match. Every time you use a case statement, that's a potential pattern match. So it has to be crazy fast. We don't let you write your own guards. We let you use these special functions that are highly optimized or a combination of them. We also have to be really careful here, because we're inside of this pattern matching engine in C++ land, and we can do anything we want to with anything in memory. So one thing that guards guarantee is that it will do those things safely. It will not mutate any of our functional data. I don't think they're even allowed to, to like allocate or deallocate memory. That would violate the functional semantics of our programming language. So this is, this is why guards are very specialized. You can only do a few things, because it's executing inside of this pattern matching engine and it has to be very careful. And it can use bound variables, and exceptions will pass through to the next guard, and then pass through to the next clause, et cetera. Okay, so we've almost defined what we want here. We're almost home free. Now we can execute our pattern match body, except now we can't execute arbitrary code, because in our idealized world here, right, we're inside of that pattern matching engine. And again, because guards are limited, the pattern matching engine doesn't know about your code or your functions you've written. So for our pattern matching first class feature, we're going to say, you can't execute any of your arbitrary code. You can use everything in guards and the bound variables, and you can restructure data, arrange it into new shapes. That's all fine, because that's all stuff we've done. Um, and we'll even give some special functions that don't exist anywhere else if you want to do something special. That's kind of the plan here. We want to avoid function call overhead, represent code as data, and honor special semantics for each of these things. And of course, Erlang already has this. This is what match specifications are, and that's great. They're first class pattern matching tools. That isn't really available in the language, but they've given us a way to pass match patterns around as data structures and invoke them when we want to invoke them. So. This is a term you can Google. If you Google Erlang match specifications, I haven't lied to you this time, uh, it pulls up a giant page of documentation on how to construct them and use them, and it's honestly very intimidating because 
I mean, there's like a dozen functions in Erlang that actually consume match specs as input of the hundreds and hundreds, and yet there's this complicated treatise on how to affect them. And the reason why it's not super easy is because what we're trying to do is a little complicated here. We're trying to access that pattern matching engine and, and somehow drive it from our code. So the documents say this is exactly what a match spec is. This is what we're trying to accomplish. It meets our, our first criteria, right? The docs say the match specification works like a function, but it skips all the function stuff, which is great. Uh, and then this is kind of the sticky part is it needs to represent code as data. So what match specifications do is they're Erlang terms representing Erlang code um, via an informal grammar, which is not exciting. Elixir has a formal grammar, right? It's home iconic, and you can do quoting and quoting and macros and stuff. Erlang doesn't really expose this to users of Erlang. So, so match specs invent their own abstract syntax tree to describe a small subset of Erlang programs, and this is how we must construct match specifications, right? That answers our question here. But it's, it's not that intimidating if you start to break down the grammar, right? Uh, the very first thing you'll realize is that back here we said, well, it has to be a list of three tuples. That's the very first part of this grammar. And if you continue reading through it, you'll just see that all the other cases help encode what's possible in patterns, guards, and bodies, respectively. So, you know, patterns, the first bit says, here's how you describe binding a variable and here's how you describe destructuring stuff. For guards, it says, well, hold, hold on, this is exactly the list of functions that are allowed in guards. That's all it's doing is describing what's allowed in them. And then the operators, right? Addition, tuple size, pretty straightforward. And then our bodies can't execute arbitrary code, but they can use everything else in the grammar we've described. So they get this tiny little section at the end that says, here's how you restructure things uh, inside of a, a match specification. So we have this feature, and we want to write our own first class pattern match. And we're going to take the example we did earlier with the points and the is it greater than x thing. Now, for, for an Elixir, this is even harder, right? If you're writing Erlang, it's like, here's Erlang code. I sort of understand how it maps one to one with this AST. Uh, Elixir, you have to go through some more convulsions, right? You have to convert your Elixir code mentally into Erlang code so that you can follow the grammar and translate your Erlang code into an Erlang data structure. And, and that's, you know, this isn't easy because some of the operators and guards that you're allowed to use in Elixir are called totally different things in Erlang. You follow the grammar, you have a data structure, you have to convert that mentally back into Elixir, and then here you've arrived at a match specification, uh, nice and proper. But you'll notice it is something sneaky. And instead of calling at the very end some function, question mark, question mark, question mark, this is an actual piece of code that will run the match specification. So we have correctly described a full match specification. And we can run that via an ETS function. So this is pretty cool. This, is, this was my goal, was first class pattern matching. It exists. That code executes more or less the way you would expect it to. Now, when you're building match specifications, it's not the funnest thing to do, right? <laughs> But there, there are some better ways to do this. There are some options. Um, ETS itself recognizes that this is a giant chore, and so it has something called a parse transform. Uh, Erlang doesn't really have AST. It also doesn't really have macros. It has parse transforms. You have to require them specially. I don't even know how you would do this from Elixir code. I think it's a command line flag when you start it up. And even then, I think parse transforms are going away. So this isn't really a great option, uh, especially for Elixirists. There is a library out there called x2ms, and you can define a function with the Elixir syntax, and it does this transform for you. And this is the current state of the art. I recommend you use this. This is where it's at. Um, I'm a big fan. It does have some limitations. Um, the two that come to mind are the Elixir code you write that's going to get turned into a match specification doesn't really go through the Elixir compiler. So you don't get warning messages that you're used to in Elixir, like unused variable here, or you know, that's just straight not Elixir dog uh, there. You don't get those things. 
Uh, I also mentioned how we're going to allow you to call some special functions depending on how you're using a match specification. And it doesn't really have a notion of that. It knows how to turn Elixir into this Erlang ask AST. I've been working on a library called Matra in my free time, which is not numerous. And it, it does try to solve some of these things. So it does use the Elixir compiler to run your Elixir code through that first, make sure it outputs the right errors, make sure it expands macros properly. And it also supports this context awareness idea of we do have some sneaky functions that we're going to allow in there. And that's really fun how I implemented that, but I don't think I'll have time to describe it. So, so these are options for constructing you know, a match specification. And when I told you originally that this doesn't exist, there is no match do keyword. But with these tools, you can get nearly exactly that and do your first class pattern matching, throw it into a variable, call it when you want to call it, pass it to other functions that can iterate over it multiple times. Okay, so now we get to the part that you probably thought this talk was about, which is how do you use match specifications? And this is going to be pretty quick because I don't have much time. But there are, you know, as I said, like a dozen functions where you can use match specifications today. Uh, and this, this actually saddens me that there's only like a dozen because I think they're really cool. But uh, you can mess around with match specs. You can try fun2ms. Let me know if you get it working. I don't know how to. Um, you can compile them into something even more efficient and, and check if it's compiled. You can test to see if it's valid according to Erlang. And then you can also just run it on arbitrary in memory code, which is what we're doing in our example, right? So you say, I want to run this match spec against the data in this list, throw out everything that doesn't match, and transform the things that do. And I, I keep on telling you this is really cool, fast functional filtering, right? First class stuff. But this is actually just as slow um, as doing it yourself with like a num.map or something. And the reason why is the list we're giving it isn't really ready to be pattern matched on by that raw C++ pattern matching engine, right? Um, lists are linked lists. They're pointers that can go all over the memory address space. Uh, binaries can be composed secretly of other binaries, and they'll never tell you. Uh, and all these things that the VM does to make our function data copying stuff feel fast works against us here, which is a shame. If only there were some place, some giant glob of in-memory data ready to be queried hanging out there for us. And that's what ETS is, right? So when we use match specs not against our in-memory data, but data that we've squirreled away in ETS, the performance for this stuff changes. It's insanely fast. If you have a bunch of data you're already throwing into ETS and you want to just pull some of it out, uh, this is where it's at. ETS has a bunch of helper functions for matching just on the pattern part. This is sort of similar to assignment. We can say, hey, ETS, give me everything that matches this pattern. You can also use the select APIs for the full match specification where you say, hey, give me everything that matches this pattern and meets these guards, and then transform it according to this body. And there's a bunch of those that happen even faster. And this is where the cool stuff is, right? Because it's doing all of this inside of ETS, which is written in C++ and very fast. You're saying, I'd like to execute this little match program. I'm just going to hand you the program, and you're going to live in C++ land and go through that incredibly fast and only send all of that data over the wire that meets my criteria. So th this is what gets me really excited about this stuff. Um, you can also use it in Manesia. Let me know if you have. Again, I've never successfully worked with Manesia. It's a curiosity for me. But match specs have a place there, too, because they're built on ETS. And then finally, you can use match specs for, for tracing. And tracing is a little less used feature. I don't have time to get into it today. But tracing is super cool. If you watched the, the keynote today that Jose Valim gave, um, where there was a really cool graph of like, here's what happened when I called this function and where it went next and where it went next. That's all built on top of Erlang's tracing engine. So if you, uh, if you start the tracing thing and then get very greedy and say, tell me every single function call that happens in the system, it will do that. And it will crash your system because that's just a lot of data, right? It doesn't just tell you your code and the Elixir standard library's code, but also all of the Erlang Center's library code that happens to get invoked along the way. So the second line here is, is how you contain this madness. Um, you can say, hey, tell me what 
tell me what gets called, but only from a certain module, or only from a certain function name, or only functions with an rt of three. And that's pretty cool, and this is how most people trace today. It's like, I really want to know when a num.mat2 gets called. So they'll specify the module function rt. But you can also throw in a match spec there and get even more specific and say, I want to know when the arguments to a num.map match this pattern exactly. And you can do stuff like, well, if someone calls io.inspect on a two-tuple where x is greater than y, only then let me know. Uh, it will do that obligingly. And it saves a lot of threat to your system from it crashing when you're that specific. Because otherwise, right, it would just send you all of this data. But much like ETS, if you provide some filters, tracing will say, OK, hold on. I have all this in-memory data, C++. But I'm going to filter it and only send what is required for performance reasons. So that's match specs and tracing. And that's match specs. Um, how am I doing on time? Does anyone know? Eight minutes? OK. Uh, I would love to take some questions, but, but before I go, I do have this on GitHub now. It's still in a prototypical phase, but um, the match is the name of the library, and it does this Elixir AST transform stuff. Um, unlike X2MS, I've tried to pass it through the Elixir compiler to give more native feeling warnings and error messages. Uh, it validates the semantics of your match spec when built, so it actually does pass it to Erlang at compile time and say, hey, have I really messed up this match spec or not? Uh, it does understand those function contexts, so in tracing match specs, you can do special things to interact in a special way with the tracing engine uh, in, your, in your match spec body, and it supports those fully. Slightly nicer error messages, I'm still working on that. Um, and this is the part that I'm really excited about, is it returns the match spec wrapped in a struct in Elixir. And structs in Elixir are how we get polymorphism. So my hope is not just to make match specs easier to compose and easier to use through a, a slightly nicer set of APIs that is still in development, but, but I also want other libraries to say, hey, maybe in a place where I was accepting a function and doing a filter map, I'm using ETS under the hood. I, I should also allow people to pass me a match specification. And if it's struct, we can say, oh, I recognize that this is a match specification, and I know I'm doing ETS here. So I'm just going to call directly out to the pattern matching engine. Uh, and that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to accomplish with this, is, is making them more accessible, not just to developers who need to go and pull something out of ETS, but also libraries themselves, hopefully, will have a little better support. Elixir is a great example of this. I think the only place Elixir supports match specifications in the standard library is registry. Uh, registry is a global process registry. It uses ETS to name processes and track them. And you can say, hey, I, I, I need to get some information about the processes I'm tracking. You can throw a match spec or something that is essentially a match spec in there and use that filtering under the hood. But but this is a little more first class. So that's the feeling I'm going for. And I really am done now. <laughs>